see its program. Pardon me, that popped up. Um, at the center for the study, I'm sorry, at the center for the study and teaching of writing. In that capacity, he facilitates workshops and develops resources for instructors throughout Ohio State about incorporating writing into teaching. Our next panelist is Zach Walton, who is the reference and instruction librarian at the Lima Regional Campus. In this role, he provides information literacy instructional sessions, working with both students of The Ohio State University, as well as students at Rhodes State College, uh, which is a co located college on the Lima campus. Zach also works one on one with students to help them with their research and is dedicated to showing them the numerous resources they have available to them through Ohio State University libraries. And last but not least, we have Allison DeVito. She is an OD library services liaison and copyright specialist. She consults with instructors on information literacy, copyright, and parallel skills in online courses. So welcome to all of our presenters today. We really appreciate you being here. So if you don't mind, Jane, going to the next slide, these are our discussion questions for our session today. And we'll just spend about um, eight or 10 minutes per question um, to kind of get the insight for from the panelists. And again, it's kind of a flowing conversation. So if it turns out that we go on to the next questions, that is perfectly fine. Um, so let me just go ahead and um, ask the first question to our panelists. Uh, what is the purpose of citations from a teaching perspective? What are we hoping to teach when we teach students to cite? This is open to the panel. Anyone who would like to jump in? I can start if you like. Um, I'm Joni Tormel. I, for, for me, this, this one is the easiest one. So that's why I jumped in there. I sometimes start my writing semester off with a question for my students. I say, okay, tell me if I need to cite this sentence, the sky is blue. And of course they say no, and they give me reasons why it doesn't need to be cited. And I say, okay, what about this? All graduate students are afraid of the dark. Do I need to cite that? And they look at me and they say, well, yes, we, we have some questions for you about that. How do you know? And I said, that's, that's why we need to cite. So that opens up our conversation about the evidence that we base our assertions on. And my goal is, of course, to come around to the point that we want our readers to understand how we came to the conclusions that we make. So that's the first part of why we cite. And then uh, my other super simple framework around why we use a citation style, why we cite the way we do, is to guide the reader to come back to our original source for the conclusions that we draw. Thank you, Joni. Anyone else, would you like to uh, participate in that discussion question? <laughs> I'll jump in and I'll, I'll kind of, um, you know, step back and, and build on Joni's great answer there. Um, so from the perspective of teaching writing across the disciplines, I, I kind of think of two things. One is I think students need to learn how citation maps the process of knowledge making. Um, so both in terms of like the process that is how, you know, ideas and information are shared how they're developed, how they're verified, you know, the kinds of things that Joni was talking about. And also kind of what I, I guess I'd call social procedures. So to the extent this is style like MLA or APA, um, but it might be things about uh, more subtle things about how people interact um, talking about a particular disciplinary topic or, you know, how scholars talk about the history of research on a field or, or a topic, how they evaluate ideas, disagree, there's all sorts of really complex language things that I think are very contextual and that students need to sort of have some flexibility in dealing with one situation or one discipline to another. Thank you. Um, 
like Joni and, and Chris said, that's kind of where my idea is uh, built upon as well is um, I really like the idea of citations to show the, the progress of ideas and um, the progress of knowledge and to teach students about that, how they're going to use previous scholarship to build on what their own ideas are and then other people in the future are going to use those ideas to continue building on knowledge and it's um, kind of a never ending um, a landscape of knowledge and how ideas are um, are progressed and things like that um, and respecting the work that came before you and even if it's incorrect um, or things like that just how those ideas formed and how knowledge can be shaped and how it can be changed um, and again kind of teaching that the that respect aspect as well I think is um, important again those ideas can be wrong and incorrect um, but just knowing where it came from and where knowledge is going And I'll, because I kind of come at this from a very similar and, and also from, in some ways, kind of a different perspective, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, and to do so, I, I kind of want to preface by like expanding a bit on, on kind of what um, instructional librarians do. Um, so addressing my role a little bit more, expanding on that, like a big chunk of my job is, is visiting classes on both sides of, you know, the Lima campus, that's OSU and Rhodes State College. And a big chunk of that is when I'm visiting these classes, I only... I, I typically do this in the setting of like an instructional one shot. So I'm, I'm visiting a class for about maybe 45 minutes to an hour. So I, I only have like a, a short window of time to really work with these students. And when I'm working with them, I'm, I'm working in a, a wide array of subject areas and I'm working with, uh, you know, a lot of different citation styles. So like in one class, I might be focusing on like, a, you know, I, I know last week I had like an English class that was focusing on like Disney's Robin Hood and the medievalisms within it. The students had to focus on MLA and then a week prior I was focusing on a nursing class and you know students were focusing on perioperative you know interventions towards bed sores and they were focusing on APA and then prior to that I was working with you know a biology class focusing on plasmodium parasites and malaria and all this other stuff and that was CSE citation style so you know really when it comes down to this a big chunk of what I do is focusing more on showing students how to find um, the, the tools they need to actually, you know, use and find research with, you know, so how they find scholarship. And a little bit of that time I can dedicate towards citation, but I don't have a lot of time because again, I'm working in a 45 minute to an hour window. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about citation, why attribution is important. And I'll, I'll focus, you know, on, on tools to make that process easier, um, but I, I can't spend too much time, although I will always include an invitation for, for you know, to reach out to me if you need further assistance. You know, from an instructional librarian's perspective, I, I feel like the purpose of, you know, of, of citation is really to kind of familiarize students with the process of attribution, um, to introduce them to various processes of writing scholarship, as well as, you know, in, in the same vein in which they're citing sources to kind of give their instructors a way to like kind of find the sources they were using. It's, it's a great informational roadmap to, to find further information. And, you know, I, I guess more than anything, I hope that when I am focusing on citations, I just, I think the big goal is just for students to have a better understanding of attribution. That's, I think, really my main goal. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Does anyone else have any follow up that they would like to add before we move on to the next question? No? Okay. So, for our second question, um, we're asking what are the concerns with our current approaches to teaching plagiarism and citations? I can I can start with a, a little bit. Um, so I'm going to pop a, a, um, a link uh, in the, the chat to a, a project called the Citation Project, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's been going on since about 2008, so it's been almost uh, 15 years. Uh, and the, the project led by Rebecca Moore Howard and Sandra Jemison ha, um, has pulled together several um, uh, collections of student writing and looked at how these students have used citations um, uh, in a, a number of different con contexts. A lot of them are first year writing and mostly English studies departments, but also uh, they've been working on a corpus um, related to writing uh, in disciplines all throughout uh, the curriculum. Uh, so what they found uh, from the perspective of those of us who teach writing uh, is, is, is kind of alarming. 
um, because where students have cited, uh, they've shown, uh, I think, what is a fundamental misunderstanding of how um, writers use sources uh, in, in their work. So the first thing that they found was that students most often paraphrased um, uh, sources, um, so like single sentences out of um, a, a particular source. Uh, sometimes they would do what they call patch write, uh, and if you're not familiar with that, it's basically taking a sentence and um, adding, uh, just changing words around, but not uh, changing the fundamental structure of a sentence. Um, or they would even copy, they'd cite it, but they'd copy the sentence without uh, quotations. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is that they, when they pulled material from sources, again, it was often a single sentence, um, uh, an idea from a single sentence, and it was often from the first two pages of a source. Uh, so again, students seem to really fundamentally misunderstand, you know, how, how to use sources, and that we as instructors throughout the university have to be a lot more explicit um, about strategies for finding, reading, uh, and engaging with sources through writing. Um, so uh, we've, we've got a lot of work to do based on that research. And I'll just tag on to that and say how students use their sources. I teach at the doctoral level, so we might just expect higher level skills. And yet, um, one of my concerns at that level is students taking uh, information from the background of an article rather than from the conclusions, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, and I'm not saying that that's utterly wrong, but I keep trying to emphasize, you know, you're they're, they're taking information from someone else if it's in the background, most likely. So let's go back to that original source. And that takes a little while for students to understand. I um, sometimes approach um, plagiarism and citations in the context of the work I do with copyright. And I think for some students and instructors, the two um, are kind of often confused about what's copyright infringement versus like what's plagiarism. So um, I find it really interesting to kind of talk about some of those topics with instructors because you can plagiarize, plagiarize without uh, being copyright infringement. You can have copyright infringement without um, plagiarizing work. You know, if you take a whole paragraph of something from Darwin that he wrote, you know, that's plagiarizing, but that's not copyright infringement because it's in the public domain. Um, and, you know, you can cite a, a, a political cartoon in a paper, but if you didn't, you know, get permission for that or, you know, but that's in the larger context of fair use. But, um, you know, if you use a political cartoon in a paper, um, that could be considered, um, you know, but you cite the political cartoon, you know, that could be um, copyright infringement, but not plagiarism. So I think it's really interesting where those two um, kind of bubbles intersect in that small section of what is plagiarism and copyright infringement, which I think if somebody, you know, copying a whole paragraph from somebody that somebody wrote um, kind of happens least often when it's both very explicit plagiarism and very explicit copyright infringement. But I think there's a kind of a delicate balance when talking about those with, um, with, um, with students and things like that. Um, and kind of also mentioning what Zach said when he was talking about attribution, which plays into kind of a, um, that copyright um, and citation plagiarism conversation, um, teaching students the rights of attribution also can help empower them because they have rights as creators as well. And the content that they create has value and information and power um, as their content creators and attribution for, for their own research and things, I think is another element to add to the conversation as well. And I guess I'll, I'll jump in here and, and, you know, I actually, I do have a few concerns about some of our current approaches to like teaching plagiarism and citations. And, and really, I think a lot of this can be summed up as I, I feel like we don't focus enough on, on the why over the how. I think we're very much ingrained on this process of, of how, we, how we cite versus like why we cite. Um, and I know like even in, in my classes, like I mostly focus on citation tools and databases and, and you know, templates and like the Purdue L and et cetera. Um, with of course that invitation to see me for further assistance. But, but really I've just noticed, I, I feel like the way in which we approach citation is very much compliance driven and, and very rooted in tradition. Um, and I, I, I just, you know, I, I think especially with, with plagiarism, the way in which we approach instruction around plagiarism is it's a bit more punitive in nature. And it even was that way, like when I was a student, like in my time as a student, which wasn't super long ago, like I, 
I remember, you know, looking through all of my syllabi. And even as I look through syllabi, like to this day, I see like with the academic integrity statement, a lot of times there's like a, a zero tolerance approach. Um, and, and I feel like with that rigid zero tolerance approach, like how many instances of plagiarism that are otherwise accidental, you know, how many teachable moments are we missing out on? You know, how, you know, how much mentioned beyond that statement and beyond just assignment details, are students actually coming into contact with like any form of instruction related to like citations in their classes? Like, is it, is it something that's actually focused on? Or how many students only think to cite because they're expected to or to showcase academic integrity? Or, you know, I guess really when it comes to like, especially with plagiarism, couldn't we emphasize, you know, that not giving credit where credit is due just contributes to the erasure of scholarly voices. I mean, it's it's something along those lines. So I guess those are some up, I, I guess, a few of my concerns <laughs> around current approaches um, to teaching plagiarism and citations. Um, any of our panelists would like to add on anything um, based on what others have been saying? I'll just quickly say that uh, Chris taught me probably a decade ago to have a generous approach to students. It, it, plagiarism is often, I, it's, it is rare for me to find a student who willfully intends to plagiarize. It uh, can be due to many things. It can be anything from laziness to I, lack of confidence in writing skills. And I just we just need to, I just want to be supportive of my students and give them a chance to, to correct their error. And I've never had a case where they didn't, honestly. I think we can also add um, more context for students about what we expect when using citations, because you know, if an instructor assigns a research paper, students may think that they just want 15 sources and they want instructors the instructor wants to see what's written on the topic, where a lot of times an instructor also wants the student's voice and thoughts on that topic, not just what's written in the literature, because the instructor knows they can go to the databases and find the literature themselves. So I think students also feel a need to add a lot of like sources and citations to their paper and get knowledge from everyone else, where I think um, as instructors, we could do a better job explaining what we want from research papers like that. We wanna see um, students use that research, but also develop their own thoughts and insights where they might not need to cite for sections of a paper if they're using their own ideas and things like that. And it's okay to um, have ideas that aren't necessarily cited if they're your own or to cite those that have influenced your ideas um, in some way too. Okay, thank you. I see some some comments coming in from the chat. The panelists feel free to, to respond to comments as they're coming in. And we'll also um, come back to those at the end as well. Um, I think we might have lost Carrie. I don't know if she is back in yet. Um, so we can go ahead, we'll move on to the next question. Um, let me just share really quickly here. Um, so we can see sort of where we're at and where we're headed. Um, so our next question is, um, are our current approaches to teaching citation equitable and inclusive? Um, so would any of our panelists like to jump in with that question? I, I think I'll go ahead and jump in really quick because I, I wouldn't necessarily say that our current approach just to, to teaching citations are equitable and inclusive. And I, I guess that comes from like my own personal experience of like running into, you know, I've worked with a lot of different instructors over the years and some are more flexible you know, than others, like like Joni. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's incredible. I, I like this a lot because really citations are more about attribu attribution and giving giving credit where credit is due. Um, and, and I guess I've got some quotes here that I'll probably occasionally read as I'm like going through my answers. But, you know, this one's from like Kelly J. Baker's Citation Matters, published in Women in the Higher Ed. You know, but our work is never composed of only our ideas, research and writing. Our work is never ours alone. It is always dependent on other people, their ideas, their analysis and their scholarship. We should be honest about that. And I, I really, I love that quote because citation is really about attribution. And that's even if, you know, some commas are misplaced per se. Um, but in the same vein, I've encountered a lot of, you know, rigid instruction on citations. I've encountered a lot of rigid expectations. Um, and, you know, I recognize there's a time and a place for that. I, I totally get that, especially like if we're looking at like legal studies. You now I, I recognize the documentation really matters, but you know, I feel like this has created kind of a dissonance in, in how our students experience um, instruction related to citations, that that in itself has become kind of unequitable. And on top of that, 
um, I mean, we, I don't know if we're as cognizant of, of experiences, um, you know, that our students have had prior to coming to OSU. I, I think we're making a lot of assumptions about students' knowledge. Um, I don't think that, you know, we've, I don't think we've made our expectations very clear on citations. Um, and it's kind of, it seems like as far as like flexibility goes, it's kind of a lock of the draw situation, right? I mean, like students by and large, like, it, you know, if they get into a more flexible um, environments where, where there's a lot of, a lot more time spent on citations, I mean, that's kind of luck of the draw. And as far as inclusivity goes, I mean, are we encouraging our students to, to cite heavily cited sources versus like less heavily cited sources? Whose voices are missing from, from our students' citations? And I, I guess, who are we erasing with, with citations? Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's really, you know, my, my point on our current approaches <laughs> to teaching citation. Um, I thought I saw a question come up in the chat. Um, how can we find what they know or need to know? Um, to kind of address this, Kathleen, I, I do, when I'm, when I'm visiting classes, a lot of times, you know, and I don't have a great answer for all of these questions, but I, I guess like when I'm visiting classes, I try to take a very empathetic approach and I, I directly ask students if they're comfortable with citations, like the, spe the specific citation styles they're using um, to kind of inform how I go about, you know, talking about citations, what resources to pull up, stuff like that. Um, and, and so I guess that's really where I come at this from. Um, but yeah, and then Danny says, many students say citation are so you don't get accused of plagiarism. They focus on the bad part. I agree with that. I think that there is kind of a, a focus on the negative there. I, I don't, again, I think that goes back to like the, we don't focus as much on the why as we focus on the how. So but I'll go ahead and mute. I'll, I'll talk about, again, about sort of what I see as the, the larger context. So I think, you know, like a lot of the issues of inequity that we've been talking about uh, for a while and that have pretty much existed in the academy uh, since the beginning, uh, I think uh, there are two components that I think uh, sort of show why I think, you know, how we think about and approach citation uh, is inequitable. So one is, is something that a scholar in our field, Asao in a way, calls um, white language supremacy. That the idea that a lot of the language we use uh, in the academy is based on uh, primarily white ways of using language. So those of us like me who have uh, had a background in you know, upper middle class, uh, suburban white education, um, I learned a, a, a lot that directly prepared me for um, using language uh, in recognizable ways in the academy uh, that would be rewarded. Uh, that's not true for a, a lot of our students, first generation college students, international students, uh, black indigenous uh, and other historically marginalized uh, people of color. Um, so there's a lot of the hidden curriculum um, that uh, sort of reflects a certain way of using language. Um, and the other component of this is, I think, one that I think a lot of fields are, are, are trying to grapple with or people are being called to grapple with, um, which is that um, the historically marginalized scholars have been excluded uh, from uh, the conversations um, in a number of ways. Uh, so there, there have been contributions, longtime contributions that have been overlooked. Um, and I think uh, voices who have uh, been kept out of the conversation. So we talk a lot about scholarship as conversation. And as Zach mentioned, you know, who, who hasn't been included in those conversations? So I think uh, the, particularly those of us who have privilege and those of us who teach students need to be very intentional about bringing in voices, the voices who haven't been recognized, who have uh, made significant contributions, invite new voices in that, that haven't been heard uh, and to center them uh, in our teaching. Um, so I, I'll give an example. Uh, we, we had a really interesting conversation in um, the Meaningful Inquiry uh, seminar that uh, Jane and her colleagues uh, put on that uh, I've, I've been a part of uh, for a number of years now. And we were, we were talking about this. And so we talked about various areas where you know disciplines are being called out and sort of sharing material that has not been recognized in, in particular fields. So I'll give one quick example you know of you know the, the site site black women um, which sort of you know encourages people to very intentionally include black women in uh, the scholarship that they cite. 
uh, and a number of people shared, um, you know, databases of, of work by uh, historically marginalized scholars that they've kept either behind the scenes or that have been um, shared um, among colleagues. Uh, and so often, often this is happening off the beaten path and um, uh, we need to deliberately uh, bring uh, these voices in and center them. While I was uh, prepping for the panel, um, I was coming. I came across a piece by Maha Bali that she wrote on inclusive citation practices, which I um, thought was really great. And I can put the link in the chat because um, a lot of what um, Chris and Zach were saying about um, highlighting voices and scholars of people who have may have historically been marginalized. Um, because in the piece, she talks about challenging researchers, and in this context, that can be instructors and students. Um, to look at their citations and their research to see who they cite um, and if the um, scholars they cite are too homogenous in any way um, and if they're too white or Western influenced to find um, scholars from different groups that have voices um, worth elevating who have maybe been historically left out. And that can also get into the conversation about um, journal indexes and citation practices and what um, what citations are scholarly or have authority versus previous work that they have cited and the power structures that are inherent in, in some of that. Um, because there's a lot of voices that are left out of the conversation. And I'll just wrap up by saying all excellent points by my colleague. And, and back to the focus on students, uh, Deidre said, this is why it's important, especially when it comes to international students and what they've been taught in their own traditions and countries. I used to teach at a community college in Southeast Ohio that had a, a significant segment of students from the Caribbean islands. And one time, uh, just a quick story here, I, I had a, a young man submit a paper that was copied word for word from his source. And I, I said, we, we can't do this. And I explained why, and he said, oh, oh certainly we can, it's, it's accepted. And it took me a couple of days and he had to check with a couple of people, but you don't know what's, what information students are getting if they are educated, if their educational foundation came from a different place. There are, there are things that we would not necessarily find acceptable that are taught in other places. And so if we have the expectation that people aren't gonna plagiarize, then we need to really, really make that clear and make it clear why. Great. Want... Oh, go ahead, Allison. Go oh, ahead. Sure. I was just gonna say, um, uh, Brian in the chat, I think had a really good point. I just wanted to mention that um, faculty could also do um, a good job of setting an example for students, which I think is important to remember um, that you, there are practices you want your students to see, try modeling them yourself. I know it becomes easy if you are, you know, taking a, you have a gif of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer or something like that, you know, putting an attribution for it could seem, you know, redundant or something like that, but it just models good behavior for students and seeing that done for them, I think can help um, ingrain that practice in them for that academic standard, no matter if it's, you know, a gif in a PowerPoint or a scholarly source, because that attribution um, has value all the same. I'll, I'll, I'll build on something that Zach said and that, that Derek has, you know, and uh, said in, in the discussion that students often sort of see citations as this addition, um, that it's just check uh, text, you know, dots on a page uh, that mean something rather than the people behind that. And I think, you know, thinking more about how we sort of help students to see the people behind um, this work that's done and the, you know, the collective work that this scholarship is really connected to. Um, I think, you know, sh talking about the people behind it uh, will go a long way to sort of, you know, help them kind of resituate how they see the uh, citation in their work. Any other thoughts about this question? This has been a really good discussion. This is obviously a topic of interest <laughs> for many of us. Um, definitely something to continue to explore. 
so uh, let's go on to our uh, next question. Um, are there any alternatives to our current approaches to teaching plagiarism and citations? For example, could we emphasize functional attribution over specific styles? What elements are necessary for successful citing? I'll kind of jump in here um, and take a stab at this. Um, so for me, I, I love the idea of functional attribution over specific styles. I, you know, I, I think that a comma being out of place or the wrong placement of like the month, date, and the year um, really probably shouldn't count against an otherwise great paper. Um, I mean, all in all, I think that as we've discussed many times today, you know, I think citations really are about attribution. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, how much time are our students spending on citations anyway? I, I mean, you know, just, you know, and how harmful is it that, you know, if they write an otherwise great paper to take minor points off just because of, you know, a, a comma being out of place. I feel like a lot of the time spent on citations and, and you know, the, the energy to try and make sure that they are correct points aren't taken off really, you know, could be better spent on, on further research or reviewing what they've already written, stuff along those lines. And I, I just wonder if that's like really the best way to like cover citations and attribution and everything. I, I feel like we could avoid unnecessary harm, even just with functional attribution. And I love the idea of a universal citation style. I think that'd be great. I, I, I have no idea what it would look like. I, I don't even know if I'm the best person to determine what that would look like. But, you know, I do think it would be very cool to see I just feel like, you know, by and large, as far as like a universal citation style goes, or even if we were to embrace functional attribution, I think it would require like significant systemic academic change. And, and I think that's something that we would have to kind of, kind of accept. I think by and large, it's totally feasible, but you know, it's not something we could do as just one institution. Granted, I recognize that the Ohio State University is a big 10 call, like a big 10 university where, where we have a lot of influence, you know, we hold a lot of sway, but but you know, this would be something that we'd have to consider with publishers too, you know, the, the various database hosting platforms like EBSCO. I mean, there's a lot that kind of goes into this. So it would require significant systemic change, but I don't necessarily think that, you know, just because traffic is, is delayed or, or is slow, we don't just avoid a journey. We don't just, I mean, we're still gonna arrive at the destination. It just might be a little later. It's worth it for the small increments of change that we can accomplish. But, but you know, I, I guess that's really where I stand on that. I just want to jump in and say, I can't say how much I agree with that, how much I agree with the fact that students are spending so much time getting every comma and every parenthesis and every, oh, in the right, all the Italian, I, I don't have to tell you about it, but here's the other thing. I am responsible for helping my students get their scholarship into journals and journals or or even I just submitted to a conference recently that has on its rubric, they're going to take points off if my citations aren't formatted correctly. How, am I, I, how do I balance those two things? Yes, I would love a universal style. Yes, I would love not to have to read 20 citations at the end of every paper submission to make sure every period is in place. But I've got to teach my students to do it right, right? So I'll, I'll build on, on that a bit too. Um, I'll, I'll agree with pretty much what everybody has said, but maybe offer you know a slightly different way in. So I, I definitely like the idea of functional attribution, um, but I think I would say, you know, using the, you know, thinking in terms of functional attribution through the different styles that are available. So as we've been talking about, thinking about form over function, um, I think the APA, for example, does a very good job of situating its citation practices in the context of, you know, doing social science. Um, and the more that we do that, um, you know, I, again, I like the idea of a, a universal citation style, but one of the interesting things about the history of some of the citation styles, for example, the MLA, were, were, were designed to try to be that kind of, um, you know, the MLA citation uh, style was, I think, developed in the, the 50s or 60s um, as a way of simplifying uh, Chicago style. So moving away from footnotes um, to primarily 
um, uh, parenthetical citation uh, as, as a way that was easier to teach um, than I think Chicago style was. Uh, so I, I think, again, going back and thinking to help students think more flexibly um, and contextually. So, you know, when people ask me, you know, should I be using, you know, MLA or APA um, or just no, does it really even matter? And I, I, what, what I'll say is sort of a, 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 you know, kind of a combination of what Joni and Zach said. I said, I, I usually say, you know, use multiple styles because that's the, um, and, and ask students to reflect on, on how that works uh, in particular contexts so that they can have, you know, really think carefully about the kind of choices they're making. Um, because that's what they'll be asked to do in their professional and civic lives to be able to, you know, use a variation of styles and to think very carefully and to work with their colleagues to sort of think about how they're, you know, making different choices in, in, in different contexts, um, you know, both in terms of the language that they use, uh, as well as sort of, you know, things like formatting. Before we move on, could um, just in case people in the audience aren't aware of what a functional citation is or what that would look like, could someone speak to that? I'll, I'll give it a stab, and if I, I miss, you know, sort of the, the the technical, as I understand it, it's sort of thinking about, you know, making attribution in in more. Um, in context, so you're not using a particular format, but you're, you know, kind of giving attribution. Um, and I, this, there's a couple of examples that I think might be interesting. So, for example, in film, um, there might be an homage, which is interesting because part of the point of an homage is to sort of suggest it so that people who already know will recognize. For example, in you know, the Phantom Menace, the whole pod racing scene is from Ben Hur. Uh, very deliberately taken from that, and you're the, you're supposed to recognize that. So that's a kind of functional attribution. Um, and I'll I'll sort of say this will I'll put on my medievalist hat. I was uh, trained as a medievalist in graduate school. Um, the whole idea of authorship was built on um, authority that, that you you knew your citations and that you pushed put yourself you know um, in relationship to people who were recognized, uh, you know, authorities. So there was a certain citation along with that, but it wasn't necessarily explicit. In fact, sometimes it was really complex how you talked about your relationship to the authors who preceded you. Um, so um, it, it, I, I think there are a lot of different ways of doing it, including, as I suggested, you know, kind of looking at the existing citation styles through the lens of functionality. What are cite, cite what are the different things that people are doing when they cite? You know, are they presenting, you know, um, uh, information? Are they evaluating information? Are they, you know, disagreeing? Um, are they agreeing? You know, there are a whole lot of, of, of functions to that citation has and bring, focusing on that rather than the format in and of itself. Thank you, Chris. Would anyone else like to chime in on this question? Yeah, I don't have a ton to add that hasn't been said by um, the other panelists. Those are some really great thoughts and ideas because I am also in favor of a type of universal citation style what that would look like because to me it looks like the information someone else would need to find that research in a database or something like that less about again where what's italicized and you know what the where the periods and commas are but you know can i find use that information in that citation to go find that research myself in a database or something like that is what you know a functional style looks like to me to um point others where they found that research and things like that. Um, because I think too, citations like Chris mentioned earlier are a part of kind of the hidden curriculum that there are a lot of instructors that just expect students to know how to cite. They've potentially been doing it from high school or you know in first year writing or something like that, but students have different experiences and are coming from different spots in life and things like that. Um, that I think if it's important to an instructor, they should emphasize it and teach it and review it in their course if they are able, because it's not just something everyone knows, assuming everyone is a traditional student, you know, in college from ages, you know, 18 to 22 with a rigorous academic or, you know, pre-college high school experience that prepared them for college. Um, Cause it's kind of one of those things that are, is expected from students, but not a lot of instructors necessarily spend a lot of time um, 
of doing or of focusing on. Great point. Anyone else? Okay, I think we have one last question. And that is, uh, is citation a political or neutral act? I'm going to start just because I find this, I found this question to be the most difficult one to answer. So I'm anxious to hear what my colleagues have to say. I'd never actually heard a citation being political or neutral before uh, I was asked to participate in the panel. So I checked around with some colleagues, including one very prolific nursing author who's been at authoring for a very long time and, and is published widely. And she had not heard of it either, but she said, you know, to for something to be political, something has somebody has to have something to gain, right? And I said, yeah, and we got to talking about that. And I found uh, an article that helped me understand perhaps what's going on here. I'll put it in the chat in just a second. But the point seems to be that, and I think it's already been made by the panelists in this session, that if you cite someone, you give them a little bit of power every time, right? And so if you don't, if you choose not to cite someone that, that may be taking away from them. In nursing, I'm going to argue that it's citation is not necessarily political or neutral, but maybe it's transparent simply because we focus on what's called evidence-based practice. So we look at the strength of the evidence and that's how we decide who to use in our articles, who to use, who to cite. And we only have a certain amount of room in journal articles to do that. Our reference list is, is uh, limited, let's say. And so we have to pick the strongest evidence and that's how we decide. So yes, we give somebody of that little piece of power whenever we cite them. But the idea is that in the ideal world, it's it is that person with the strongest evidence. So I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm going to uh, let my colleagues weigh in on that. So I'm going to I'm going to jump in here, and I I have to say, you know, I was I I was very new to the idea of like citations being political too, um, and that a lot of like the, a lot of what I've learned about citations and 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 this question really. Um, I, I have to acknowledge I learned from Jane Hammond's blog post to the teaching and learning blog, um, as well as all the sources that she included. But I, I definitely feel that <laughs> citations are a political act, that they aren't necessarily neutral. And I feel like, you know, from a librarian's perspective, I think, you know, I, I have to acknowledge that I, I feel like a lot of forms of documentation really kind of are political. And, and to kind of dive into this idea, you know, I, I to quote Kelly J. Baker again from that citation matters um, post, um, you know, for better or likely worse, citations hold sway in academia. They determine scholarly reputation, they identify whose works matter um, and has significance. They offer prestige in what is clearly a prestige economy, um, and citations just matter. Um, and also to add to that, um, Salem State University Library and their webpage evaluating sources act up citation politics. Um, shared, and I, I think Chris kind of acknowledged this earlier on, um, but women are cited less on average than research authored by men, but if a woman co-authors with a man, the paper has a higher chance of being cited. People of color and other marginalized folks are less cited than their white colleagues, even if they have more experience and authority than white researchers. Well-cited scholars have authority because they are well-cited, but well-cited does not mean quality, especially at the expense of those less cited. Um, you know, and I, from my perspective, teaching, you know, um, research strategies and things like that, I've noticed um, that there are numerous resources that our students are going to be using that do display um, the citation count system, from like Biosis for, for biology students all the way to Google Scholar. Um, we have citation counts listed there. And unless otherwise, you know, discussed with our students, wouldn't our students be more likely to consider heavily cited works more reliable and maybe overlook less cited works that are more current or from more diverse scholarship. I, I mean, it's just, you know, when I think about some of the quotes that I just read, it just becomes so clear to me that citations really equate to power in an academic setting and that, you know, really, I think we need to be cognizant of like the, uh, the, the politics of citation that, that we have to be careful in the distribution of that power and, and really try to not contribute, no matter how unintentionally to the erasure of, of diverse voices. Thank you so much, Zach and Joni. Um, Allison and Chris, would you like to chime in on this question? 
Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, based on what I said earlier, uh, I definitely think that citation is a political act. Um, you know, built, you know, everything that Joni and, and Zach just said, um, I definitely agree with sort of on the side of, you know, what citation does for those who, who are cited. So I think I'll, I'll build on that by sort of thinking about, you know, what does it add for the people who are doing the citing? Um, what's political about that? Um, I think one component to this too is thinking about how we are empowering our students to engage with the discourse of uh, academic like like um, work uh, and why that might matter to them. Um, so you know, helping students to be able to position their ideas, to position themselves, uh, maybe even position their identities in the context of our disciplines. Um, I think you know, helping students understand how they use language in the context of engaging with sources and research um, are gonna play a huge part in sort of, you know, kind of positioning themselves. Uh, and I think that's a, a, another important part about, you know, what we need to get students to, to, to think about. How do they represent themselves uh, in these, um, you know, in the context of academic discussions and, and say meaningful things uh, uh, in these academic conversations. Great, thanks. I'll add a lot to what um, has been mentioned earlier as well. You know, I, I do believe citations are political because when you choose to cite someone, um, it's a choice, it's a conscious act. And um, by the definition of that, you know, you can't cite every piece, every idea on a specific topic or something like that. So there are inherently choices made, um, which is inherently giving value to what you choose to cite and why, um, whatever that value judgment is um, that it can really get into like a gray area and things like that. But I do think it's inherently um, political and it plays into like the power structure of, um, you know, of, of the scholarly communications field of publishing, the publishing landscape, who is accept accepted by different um, journals and um, who those journals choose to publish and who have they cited and who are they citing. Um, and like I um, was also looking at the um, the Kelly J. Baker article that um, Zach mentioned as well, you know, because citations hold sway and have the impact that scholarly reputation for um, for researchers and things like that. Um, so I think it, yeah, citating plays, citing plays into that, um, that power dynamic of, of information and access to information and things like that. Does anyone else from the panel like would like to follow up on that or jump back in? Okay, well, if not, that was our last question for our presenters. Thank you so much for uh, giving your time to this. I want to uh, go ahead and just for the last few minutes that we have here, open it up to questions. Um, I would say maybe Jane, since you've been monitoring the chat, did you see any questions that um, maybe questions, you know, a same question that came up a lot from different people or anything that you saw that you think would add to the conversation? Yeah, sorry, there's some uh, some great comments in the chat and some questions here as well. Um, so one that I, I saw that was interesting, Kathleen asked, um, do, do journals explain exactly why they need a particular format for publishing, for categorizing, for uniformity? Um, I don't know if anyone has a, an answer to that question, um, but I would love to hear any perspectives that uh, folks have there. Yes and no. I, the, so I write for nursing education journals and the ones that I write, the three big ones, one takes one wants APA, one wants AMA, and one wants a style that seems to belong only to them. So I uh, I don't have an exact answer. I just have my suspicions. <laughs> and uh, the the AMA style seems to be for the this particular journal I'm thinking of seems to be more closely associated with medicine, maybe. And the fact that you can use. Um, superscript numbers in AMA style in, in text, and yet the cita the reference list looks more like APA style. 
that's probably if I were to develop a universal style, I think that's what I'd go with. Uh, then the other two, they seem to do it out of tradition more than anything else. And if you just use a consistent style, they'll actually have their copy editors change some things for you to fit the way they want. I know that's not an answer to the question, but that's all I've got. So thanks, Tony. That was helpful. Anyone else? So um, just to jump again, uh, Ruth had add, um, er, asked earlier um, if anyone has any good resources to teach uh, the why of citations. Um, so I'm putting a link in the chat there to an instructor resources site that we have uh, from the university libraries. And we have a page in there on ethical information practices. We have several videos and resources um, that look at citations from that perspective of why. There's a couple of great videos on there. Um, one's from the University of North Carolina Writing Center. Um, one is from NC State University, sort of on the why we cite issue rather than the, the citation format. Uh, so some great resources there. Um, yeah, other questions that folks have, and I think um, uh, you can, uh, Chris, could you unmute? You wanna go ahead and say something? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna uh, add. So uh, the Writing Across the Curriculum team a, a few years ago created a, a, a module in Carmen uh, that kind of walks students through um, thinking about citation through, um, you know, kind of the lens that I've been talking about and contextual. So, you know, helping students to think about the purposes of citation and particular assignments. Um, and we kind of use actual assignments from uh, instructors to sort of help you know, students sort of look at like, how is citation going to play a part um, in a particular role? Why is it meaningful for this assignment? What educational purpose does, does it have? And then we walk students through, um, you know, looking at scholarly examples of citation. You know, we've got annotated uh, examples of scholarship. Uh, we also have um, examples of student work um, that we walk through that, you know, help students sort of see what this actually looks like in practice. And they actual uh, actual student responses to the um, uh, assignments that we mentioned. So um, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, um, share it properly to uh, Carmen Commons. Um, but you know, if you're interested, let me know and I can at least uh, get you access to some of the videos and resources connected to it. Um, and uh, Danny asked, um, what's the worst thing that you've ever heard an instructor say or do regarding citations and student assignments? Um, and Stephanie Schulte shared in the chat. I don't know, Stephanie, if you wanted to unmute and share your story there as well. Um, but any of our panelists that uh, were interested in uh, answering that question. It's sending a student straight to COAM without giving them a chance to explain. You know, I'm I'm gonna add here that I most of the time when I'm visiting a class, like you know, outside of what I'm doing, like citation isn't covered by the instructor, so I don't necessarily get to see what an instructor says or does regarding citations and student assignments. I think the you know, as far as like the the maybe the oddest I guess request I've gotten um, has been more or less to actually walk students through like you know if they were to like use like a citation in a database like academic search complete or something like how they would correctly copy and paste this and put it into a word document how to review it pull up purdue owl all of this all of this stuff which is totally fine and i love that but i i think like you know they that was the only time outside of maybe a few instances where where instructors are like oh can you cover like annotated bibliographies too um where citations play like a, a major role like by request from an instructor i guess is what i would have to say to that A lot of the work that I do with ODs um, and the instructional designers is trying to be proactive with some of the um, online resources we develop and uh, um, some of the work I do is to kind of like Zach mentioned and be like proactive with these um, like kind of these student bottlenecks is kind of a lot of times what we call them if their students are struggling with citations or assignments that require citations like uh, ancient bibliographies or literature reviews. I um, help create resources for students um, to kind of work through those, um, those bottlenecks to try and be a little more proactive um, 
and understanding different citation styles and um, citation tracing and things like that. Some of that work is on the instructor resources site um, that Jane mentioned um, in the chat. Um, and the link is in the chat too. Um, so that's been my experience, luckily less uh, punitive or negative in some of those contexts. If I could add in really quickly, I know we're at the last minute. Um, this is not really the worst thing, but one of the things we see a lot with assignment instructors is instructors emphasizing the citation style very early in the instructions. It's like one of the first things students see that it needs to be an APA style or this. And so really making it seem like the format is something that they're really gonna be heavily graded with rather than the content. So kind of front loading that citation plagiarism thing rather than develop your ideas, you know, explore this issue kind of format. Um, uh, so I think we're probably at the end of time. Um, Carrie, did you have um, some wrap up, wrap, up, wrap up comments? I will share the reference slide so that folks can see that, but we'll also send that out to everyone who registered. I just wanted to again thank our panelists for taking time to start this discussion here at Ohio State with us. I think. As I mentioned before, I, I felt like it was very helpful. We have people on the panel, both from the arts and sciences, as well as the health sciences. And it looks like we had a great discussion, uh, just having everyone uh, participate in this conversation. And I wanna really appreciate everyone who participated as attendees and asked really good questions and made comments in the chat. Um, I think this discussion today kind of tells Jane, uh, Zach and I that this is a topic of interest. And um, as we go back to our uh, committee at University Libraries, it might be something that um, you know we will continue to think about offering these types of sessions or having some type of resource available to you um, about these types of conversations. So just thank you again for coming out to this session and have a great day.